So I want to start my talk with a question. So we, or especially you guys who are attending, or many of you attending medical universities, know that we humans are equipped with five different senses. We have sense of smell, taste, touch, hearing, and vision. So if I will ask you a hypothetical question, if somebody comes to you and asks you, give away four out of your senses, leaving you with just one, which one will it be? Which one is the one which you consider the most important? Let's have a quick show of hands. Let's say, who will decide to stay with their sense of smell? Okay, not, okay. What about taste? Okay. What about hearing? I think we have many professional musicians or those who inspire to be musicians. Okay, touch. Okay, some of you. What about vision? All right, all right, that's what I wanted to hear. So most of us actually perceive sense of vision as the most important sense with which we interact with the world. And we are probably right because over two thirds of our sensory cells are actually located in our eyes. And ability to see color is one of the most important part of that vision. We obviously use it to see shapes and distances, but our ability to sense color is very important. So as shown on the slides, many of you know that those cones is not something from the ice cream store. We're going to talk about cones and roads which are located on the back of your retina. So how we see light. So when light is reflected from an object, like this carpet, for example, the red part of the light gets back to your eye, get focused on your retina, and on the very back of your retina, you have a layer of different cells, which are actually sensing this light. So the road cells are sensitive to low level of lights, but they cannot distinguish color. And you have three types of cells which have photoreceptors, which are more sensitive to either red, green, or blue color. So these cone cells are connected through the bipolar cells or like a messenger cells to the ganglion cells, which then lead directly to your brain. So in fact, your eye is actually extension of your brain. And I'm pretty happy with my color vision and probably most of you, but I think what we don't realize is there are several limitations to our color vision. So let's just go through those. So there are four main limitations. A, as I mentioned, we have only three types of cones. And many animals have more than three. The champion among them is this creature called mantis shrimp. It has not three, not five, not eight, but 12 different photoreceptor cells. And so for a long time, you know, physiologists or people who love science, they were salivating over the thinking, oh my gosh, if we can see so many colors, how many colors this mantis ship can see? But what, uh, you know, that's just kind of depiction of what your eye see compared to the different receptors which this mantis strip have inside their eyes. But what was discovered several years ago by Australian team is actually when they did experiments and they put to test those extraordinary eyes of the mantis strip, which till now was considered to be the, the most advanced eye evolutionary developed, and compare it to the human ability to distinguish color, they discovered that actually humans can see or distinguish about 10 times more shades of color than the shrimp. So actually, I think it's not the shrimp which is extraordinary, but those researchers who are able to train shrimp to recognize certain colors, because it's been 30 years and I cannot even teach my husband to recognize certain shades. <laughs> But what is the reason behind this interesting uh, phenomena? It's because uh, in shrimp, we have these multiple photoreceptors, but they are connected to a very small brain. 
In our case, we have only three, but they're connected for a very, at, uh, to a very large processing machine, essentially. And it's been known that about 50% of our brain is actually involved in analyzing visual information. So having this ability to distinguish color, and it's been actually reported that humans can distinguish up to 10 million different shades of colors, three times population of Armenia. Pretty amazing, right? So this allows us to enjoy beautiful scenes of nature, beautiful flowers, and our beloved mountain Ararat, which I think most of you agree, every hour of the day you look at it and it seems to be a different color. Like on this picture, for example, you can have a different color at night or during the uh, sunset. Do you guys agree that this mountain has a different shade of color? In this big inclusion, how many of you agree that it has a different, same color or a different color? Different color? Same color? Okay. Why I'm going to remove background, and you will see that it's actually exactly the same color. This is what is called optical illusion. And this is actually a result of the fact that whatever you perceive as a color, it's not just what's coming from your pigments, it's actually how your brain analyzes this information. So brain put this all this additional information about the background, contest, and other information it gets from different sources to interpret that color. And so each of us see color very differently because we have a different composition of our rodent cones, because we have a different genetic big makeup of those photoreceptors, because we have different brains. So next time you're going to argue with your friend about color of their favorite sweater being it brownish or uh, you know, greenish, he's not doing it because, you know, he's insisting on his obviously wrong choice, right? He's just seeing it that way because his brain is different. So this brings us to the second limitation. Our vision is very subjective. So we cannot really have a universal even opinion about certain color. So, you know, but it is important to uh, actually put something, some name or some number on a color. For example, in cosmetic industry, right? Let's say, uh, you know, you go to the store and are there's all these different shades of pink and, you know, cosmetic industry can come up with all this sexy, interesting name, hot pants, revenge. But can you imagine that you have a patient coming to your office and they showing the skin rash on their color and you saying to them, well, I think it went from hot pants to revenge color. I mean, reaction will be very <laughs> interesting, to say the least. So that's ab ability to subjectively evaluate color. It's definitely something we can improve on. The third limitation at the actual limited spectral range. So we, human, obviously call that range visible because what is what our eyes can see is a light between 400 and 700 nanometers. So the light which will have a longer wavelength is called infrared, and the light which will have shorter wavelength is called ultraviolet. So different animals, birds, insects, reptiles, they actually can see in those other ranges, something which we cannot see. So when an insect look at the flower, to which, which to your eye look being yellow, it actually sees those, all these different colors, allowing them to determine where they can find the most nectar. So lastly, the last limitation is that our color vision uh, requires a lot of light. So I can really see the color of your jackets, people on the back of this audience, because in a low light condition, it's only our rod cells which are react to the light. Your cones need to have a higher amount of light in order to recognize the color. In addition to not being able to see color when it's kind of dark, it also limits our ability to see what is called autofluorescence. And autofluorescence is a very important property of different uh, substances, especially biological ones. So what is fluorescence? Well, when I look at this carpet, basically I have this white light shining on, and then whatever is reflected, which is mostly red light, gets to my eye, that is reflected light. If I'm going to eliminate an object with a blue light and I will not have anything else, and that object will emit something of a different wavelength, 
that's called fluorescent. The problem with the fluorescent, it has much, much lower intensity. So our eyes really cannot see the fluorescence, and it's not something we even aware in our everyday life. So I'm here to tell you that there is a technology coming soon to your life, which will be basically helping us to avoid all these limitations of human vision. And this technology is called hyperspectral imaging. And what it does, it combines the benefits of the mantis shrimp eye, where you have multiple photoreceptors detecting light at different wavelengths, and this huge processing power of human brain, which then analyzes the spectrum. So it is basically composed of those special cameras called hyperspectral cameras, and then signal from those cameras go to the computer to be analyzed. So it looks like this. You have an object, and the camera will collect the images from this object, but by putting different filters in front of it very, very quickly by different ways. So as a result, you have this stack of images, and each pixel in this image is going to have an entire spectra. Meaning, for example, like in this case, the pixel which you see as red will have mostly intensity, uh, high intensity in the red range. And then pixel which is blue is going to be having higher intensity in the blue range. But you don't have just a single dot, you have entire spectra. So this spectra then go to the computer which source the spectra and decide this looks similar or this look different. In this spectre, I have a 30% of that sub substance and 40% of this substance, and then remaining percentage of the third substance. So you have a capacity for basically unraveling or uh, detecting different substances within the visual object by using this technology. So hyperspectral imaging, as I said, addresses all this limitation. And uh, it actually was originally designed for astronomy. Then it became very popular in different military applications. It was put on surveillance plane to uh, detect where the movement of troops occur, because you can distinguish different soldiers from different armies based on their uniforms. Now it's slowly making its move into different field of science. There's something which called precision agriculture where you can put hyperspectral camera on a plane, fly over the field, and it will tell you where exactly you need to add a little bit more water or where you need to uh, add fertilizer because the shade of that crop is now different from the rest of the field. But in my lab at George Washington University, we're interested in application of hyperspectral technology to cardiovascular targets. Specifically, I want to show you how the endocardial surface of the atria, which is this upper chamber of your heart, looks. So it looks very white because it has this thick layer of collagen. And therefore, when you're trying to put the lesions to eliminate sources of uh, arrhythmic activity, you really cannot see it. When you apply HSI and tell it, OK, find the spectra typical for the lesions, that's what you were able to see. Or if you have a surface of the heart on which you have a scar tissue and you have a tissue which was just recently damaged, both of these type of tissue will look whitish to your eye. But if you apply HSI, you clearly can distinguish scar from acutely damaged tissue. Another application. Many of us know that people are suffering from the atherosclerosis or deposition of the plaque in the coronary arteries. This is how coronary plaque, when you open the artery and look at it under the regular light, will look to your eye. And this is how it will look under hyperspectral. So you can immediately tell the composition of the plaque, what's likelihood of its rupture, how big it is. And it gives you a lot of very useful diagnostical information. The last three slides were all example of in vivo samples, meaning there were no additional dye, nothing, just shining blue light and uh, analyzing out of fluorescent using HSI approach. This is an example of the histology, which is also extremely promising field for hyperspectral imaging to be applied. You can see here, this is a section of the animal heart, and part of it is damaged because of the high energy. And by eye, you really don't see any difference in color. We apply HSI, you can clearly see 
the, this area was much damaged than the other side. So we now moving from this field, which is having big camera and you know desktop computers, to something which is going to be future of medicine. Now there are handheld hyperspectral imagers where you can just put it against your skin, and then you collect the spectra and you send it to the cloud where that spectra are then compared with something which was collected from many, many patients. And if spectra in that skin sample matches with somebody who had melanoma in the past, you can get immediate diagnosis. Or you can have a, a advice to go to the dermatologist and see because it's something suspicious. So with these cameras getting smaller and smaller and less and less expensive, obviously one can envision you know, something like this. You're going to have a phone, you can check whether you know, the currency is fake or real one. You can try to use it in the kitchen to create perfect dolma. You can remove all the impurity from your rice mixture. You can use it in construction. It can help you to detect what part of the wood is actually damaged by the moisture. Or if you're making a barbecue, let's say you decided to say, well, is it well done or have done? then you can apply hyperspectral imaging and actually see what is there. This technology is coming to your door or more exactly to your mobile devices faster than you think. So ask yourself, what would you like to see beyond your biological vision? Thank you.